Is baseball still America's pastime? We're going to find that out with our boy, John Jones. This is the first ever Flashing the Leather. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the first ever Flashing the Leather. And if you have been watching the Iceman and Coach Sports Show, you know that Coach and I started to do a little bit of a branch off with some niche topics that we are calling INC Sports. And baseball was a topic that I wanted to talk about because I used to love baseball. And I'm not equipped to talk about baseball all by myself. I need some help. So I have brought in an aficionado of what is has been known as America's pastime, Mr. John Jones. Johns, welcome to the studio, my man. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Isn't it fun to do this? This <laughs> yes. is something that not a lot of people get to do after work, late at night when the kids are in bed. You're right. And it is exciting. I'm glad. I'm very glad to be here, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about the sport. I am very happy to talk about it as well with you. So I think what we have to do is we have to establish what I like to call our bona fides in baseball, because I don't think that we can do baseball content with out really saying like why we are equipped to be able to do this. So what I want to do with you is talk about or have you tell the audience how you lo- started to love baseball, what got you into it, childhood memories, things like that, because I think that is one thing that baseball is uniquely equipped to talk about is so many people, their memories are steeped in nostalgia. Well, I guess the first, the team that I remember earliest, and I mean, maybe everyone needs to start there. We're like, when did I start really getting into baseball and it really and I'm a Phillies fan and I know you're a Red Sox fan and it's when the team you know as a kid your team gets good and when I saw that it was 1993 and I was I, you know I got baseball cards it came with the bubble gum and you open it oh yeah and you see and it's yeah you kind of do that stuff but when your team gets good it's on another level so I was an army brat and we were actually overseas in Germany but and the games would come on at 2 30 in the morning or something so I'd wake up in the morning and find out if they won they did not win the World Series but after kind of living through that playoffs, I was hooked. And every year I'm like, are they good? Are they good? Since then, I've kind of always and I and I still know the players on that team and I still kind of cherish. And, and John Cruck was on that team and now he's an announcer. And I and I love that. It's and so that that's my earliest like nostalgic moment of that sport. And for me, I grew up because I think it's a familial thing for me. I grew up in the New England area, so New England sports traditionally have been losers. It has only been the last, what, 20 (laughs) years or so in which they have been considered winning and hated. But for a very, very long time, there was not a lot of success. There wasn't a lot of joy that came from being a Red Sox fan. But because my dad was a Red Sox fan, I, by extension, also became a Red Sox fan. And we went to Fenway Park every single summer. So I got to go to what it was is now considered a cathedral in baseball. But I was young. But I didn't know what real winning was. And so it was a pure love of the game because I just loved to watch it and love to see it. And so rarely did I get the opportunity to see the team do well. Division titles was about as good as it got for us. And then in 2004, everything changed, obviously. But that, that was a magical year. For, no doubt. For a lot of things. I mean, it was it, it was after the Bartman year, which is also magical for so many different reasons. But my point being is that baseball is uniquely tied to a lot of people's childhoods. Like I, I've never personally met anybody who said, oh, I, I got into baseball when I was in my 20s or I get into baseball in my 30s. I, I feel like a lot of people were almost grandfathered into loving baseball because it's really an easy sport to get kids into. That's a great point. Your kids are into it. Yeah, they're into it more mainly because I'm into it. And and that's kind of feeding into like, yeah, you kind of indoctrined into it, like you just mentioned. That's, you know, I hadn't even thought about that, but that's true. I've taken my kids to Washington Nationals games. Um, we we watch it. We get MLB TV. We watch highlights. It's that's the best way to consume the sport, in my opinion. By the way, um, doing those um, condensed games and recaps. But yeah, you're right. I they love baseball because I do, no doubt. We're also willing to be a sponsor for MLB TV. If oh. MLB TV <laughs> is is in the market for a sponsor. That was a great little plug. Use the word indoctrinated. So much of a better word than what I use. You're a wordsmith in in. I just, I just, for some reason now in my forties, and I think you're in that same place too. I think we're about in the same age. And yeah. Yep. Baseball to me has become more enjoyable through other people. The game has evolved in a lot of ways and 
not all for the bad, but when we were watching baseball. Oh, it's always evolved. It, it always has. Yeah, it's more this year, but. But it's a more subtle evolution for baseball because baseball is so married to their past. And sometimes to the detriment of the quality of the product to the point where we don't want to give up things of our past in order to have something in our future. And that's where all of this debate about the pitch clock has come in. Now, I will say this. Coach and I have talked about the pitch clock on the main show. And boy, we really rumbled the bee's nest by talking about it because it is such a polarizing issue. I don't know if it is now. And that's what we're going to get into. We're going to talk about the evolution of it. But at the time, this is right before spring training happened or during spring training. Man, people had an opinion. I remember you texted me that. But you did too. Yeah. You had a negative opinion about the pitch clock and have come around since then, right? Because you were somebody who were like, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Prior to the season, yes, I did. I, I, Especially in the spring training games, there was actually a few games, one in particular that ended in a in a pitch clock violation strikeout call. And, and it was all over social media and people, you know, see that. And like, oh, my God. And I follow a lot of baseball social media and, and a lot of people see that and go, ooh, cringe. I think since then it's worked out. I've been to two baseball games this season and I stayed all nine innings. I it, That was with kids as well. So that was shocking and surprising. And I think that all of the, I think that all of it's kind of worked itself out with umpires recognizing that they need to be able to have the baseball moments and players, mostly, mainly the batter, getting in the box and getting ready and more action, more baseball. I think that's what the, I think that's what what MLB was going for was let's have more action, more product. There's enough waiting around. And I think they're right. And and once the season started, I began to recognize it now about 40 games into the season. I love it. I think when I watch a baseball game, you're getting way more action, way more pitches, faster paced. And there's there's nothing I hate about it. And I haven't I haven't watched a game that I said, ooh, I think they missed that call. I never was negative on it because I always knew that there are going to be kinks at the beginning. And that's why you put this thing out in spring training. You don't debut this in October in the playoffs because you want to make sure these kinks get out in games that I don't want to say that don't matter, but certainly games that have less of a significance. And as the season starts, you've already worked some things out in spring training. So we've seen some of these pitch clock violations and things like that that probably aren't going to happen. And there were some growing pains in April. You saw, was it Cody Bellinger who got a pitch clock violation for, was it a, a curtain call? Things like that? Yep, yep, he did. And those <laughs> things right. were addressed by the league office. I think the umpire did the wrong thing there. Of course yeah. he did. I mean, now... There's a discussion to be had about look at me, Louis umpires and and other umpires that want to be the star of the show. And that's always going to happen. It doesn't matter whether there's a pitch clock or not. You're going to have those umpires who want to be seen when the whole point of an umpire is to not be seen. 100%. So now that we're sitting here in May, we look at the data and obviously run scores seem to be up. I believe balls put in play are also up. Now, every single season for what the last like 15 years, we've seen balls in play just continue to dip and dip and dip, which takes action away from the play on the field, which then makes the game less palpable. Somehow there's less action and the games are longer. That that correlation, I, I never understood that part. I don't miss it. I don't miss uh, batters stepping out of the box, readjusting their batting gloves mm-hmm. or their knee or their br- elbow brace. Um, I, I think Bryce Harper even came back and he just came back from Tommy John surgery and he said, oh, I need to readjust my elbow guard. It stepped out of the box. To re- nope. I think he got a pitch clock violation. And, and it, now you got to get it on quicker, Bryce. And he was notorious last year for having a, like a, uh, what is it, just, you know, readjusting every glove, touching the ground. He did everything. And I liked it. But, uh, yeah, you get every player doing that. It's not fun. So, yeah, same with the pitchers. You're also seeing some strategy kind of sitting there waiting, waiting for the pl- pitch clock to go all the way down. And, and then releasing it, it kind of forces the batter to take one of those precious timeouts and they only get two, I think, per at bat. So I, I actually like it. Then you're watching it and kind of seeing the players be strategic about it. And for me, that makes it even more exciting. It's that inside baseball game. Well, and that's what makes baseball exciting in general is the it's the gamesmanship. And that has always existed and it's always evolved, too, with the game. And there's always those unwritten rules that you and I always sort of I don't want to say we roll our eyes to, but there are some things about the game that are eye roll inducing. But the action of it has been exciting. And I like it because I think there are a lot of players in the league 
that are going to be showcased. And I think the game is going to benefit from that because there are obviously your Otanis, your Aaron Judges, your Mike Trouts, but there's guys like Jazz Chisholm, right? Who their game is probably better suited for a game with more action. And even though they do hit home runs, there are a lot of guys like that. And I, and I think that the marketing of baseball is going to improve because of this. And the players aren't complaining about it. That's true. Yeah, I haven't heard any players really complain about it. Players adapt to the game. Absolutely, you have to. They have adapted like crazy. The Astros surely adapted hitting trash cans. I mean, they did a lot of those things, right? (laughs) Yeah. But the gamesmanship trying to win in the margins in baseball. Oh, yeah, getting an edge. Yeah, I mean, there's some, there was even Judge recently was eyeing his dugout where he was, you know, looking for, appearing to look like something. Can we have an aside about this? Because I... I have just yeah. seen very preliminary articles about it, and I know that the Blue Jays announcers were making a big deal out of it. I honestly don't know. Can, so can you explain to me and, and the listeners and viewers what that's all about? It, it's, it seems like it's a kind of a nothing burger. Um, the Blue Jays, it's, it's, it's basically just a, a, a kind of a, a rivalry that's heating up. It's getting really spicy. Uh, Aaron Judge, there's a picture of it where he's looking not at the pitcher, but at the dugout. And everybody's seeing that and saying, what is he actually looking at? And eh, part of me is like, yeah, he's looking over for a sign from some coach. He's, he's maybe sending a sign. I remember back in the 90s and 2000s, you'd have guys at second base on and second base giving signs to the batter when they looked at the catcher. So there's always there's always a little bit of sign steal trying to get an upper hand. The Astros went too far. They did it, what, every at bat. There was records of it. Once in, you know, once in a while, um, you try to get away with something. Um, he was caught. He was caught. But the beautiful part of the story is the next game, he goes and he's down 0-2. I think he had a strikeout. And then he crushes one to D. I mean, you can't ask for it. And Judge is a class act player. He's... I, I love Aaron Judge. Okay, I'm not a big Yankees fan, but damn, I just... Well, you can love a guy on a team without necessarily having it be on the team that you like. I mean, yeah. you can respect guys that don't play for the teams you like. Oh, you can't... I, I can't say that I hate any team, um, like, embittered hate, like a, like a Dallas Cowboys-Redskins uh, rivalry or something like that. I don't know what's different with baseball for me. Now, for you, I know you hate the Yankees because you're a Red Sox fan, maybe. As but... I've gotten older... My stance on sports has softened quite a bit. I And I think I said this to you the other day out in the yard, and I've become more of a generalist in sports. Part of it's because we do stuff like this, right, where I have to make content. And I think the evolution of the Red Zone channel in the NFL as well has done that for me because now I watch every team and every game, and I see all the good stuff. And so I, that has actually hurt, to bring it back to baseball, hurt my viewership of baseball because of how little action there is and how long the games are. But the games are getting shorter now, before we get into the teams that are happening or that are playing now and, and the results that we've seen, the pitch clock in October, by the time we get to October, are they going to make any amendments to some of these rules? Because a lot of people who don't like the pitch clock, they aren't haters of the pitch clock, but they understand that the, the tension that is built in October is what makes those games special. And is the pitch clock going to take away from that or are we, are we going to see Major League Baseball over time make some adjustments the way that, say, hockey does in their overtime? I have, I, I guess, I guess I don't know. I haven't seen any rules or amendments. And it's, it's the same thing uh, with the with a runner on second base in the extra innings. I, I don't know. I have to see if I can't not remember if they did that in the postseason last year because that was a rule from last year as well. Um, so those types of rules, I, you know, in in regular season, like saying to have the pitch clock to have the runner on second base in extra innings to make the game more exciting and more fast paced. I like it. Postseason, I want to see the real deal. I want to see that. I want to see now. I don't want I don't want to take five minutes to 10 minutes per batter for for timeouts, what have you. I want to see action. But uh, yeah, I I, I do. Definitely. If a guy needs a few extra seconds, I don't want to strike a call. I don't want to end a postseason. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Well, there's got to be some, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, we're supposed to have fun here. There's got to be some players that you would love to see that happen to. Can I get your top five? Top five players that John would love to see strike out to lose Lately, a World Lately, I've been loving hating on the Cardinals. Excellent. Um, they, they stink this year, and I absolutely love it. Um, <laughs> God, wouldn't it be great to see, like, Arenado strike out uh, on, a, on a strike three? I don't think they're even going to make the postseason. This is called the dream, John. Like, we need this. This is, if you were to create the best scenario ever of a player that you just loathe. Like a Ronald Acuna. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Nice. Right? No, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to see that, honestly. I, I, I want to see the maximum. I want to see the best competitiveness. 
that's the that's a more tepid yeah, take. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. Well, we got we got to warm up into this. I can't just have you throwing out hot takes, I guess. But it we will we will get there with the show, folks. We're gonna loosen this guy up here. So let's get to the actual play on the field. So we're in what the middle of May, and do you feel confident that we have a sample size to know which teams are good and which teams are bad unequivocally, or do you think for most teams, and we're talking ninety five percent of the league, we just don't know yet? I love that question. Yeah, when you send me that question, I'm like, oh my gosh, what a great question. Because it because I think 40 games is a great sample size for what you say. It's one quarter through the season. It's you like so if you equivalent this to NFL, you're one quarter through the season. You kind of see, okay, there's some there's some new teams coming up. Baseball, sometimes I wish was a shorter season because then you could see you've got you've got teams that are emerging now. They're fun, the Pirates, the Rays. Forget some of the other ones that are extremely hot, but a uh, low market. Marlins are five hundred. Marlins, yeah, sure. So you've got these, you've got these teams that can kind of explode early or have a rally and 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 push. But the one hundred and sixty two games, that is a long season. You've got to have the horses to go, and that's why you've got the Yankees always being there, the Dodgers, teams that spend the money. The Astros will be there for a long time. The Braves, um, and then and then execute. So I, I I hope that the Pirates and the Rays can keep up. Uh, it's it's yet to be seen. The Rays are kind of a special case because they've been doing it for a very long time, where they're able to do more with less. Um, so I, I give them a little bit more credit, and I don't know what the special sauce is down there. But I was I was going to ask you is like how do they do that? Because historically in that sport, the small market teams just cannot compete, and they're throwing out bottom five payroll and they're getting better every year. Now they haven't won a World Series. We should say that. I mean, that's the goal is to win a World Series at some point. True. And they've had some early exits. I think a couple of years ago they lost to the Red Sox in the first round. They were a hundred win team. True. But they came out of the gates so blazing hot that since then they've seemed almost tepid, right? Because they've been five and five and it's like, oh, they're on a losing streak. They're they're slumping. <laughs> and they're like twenty something games over five hundred. Their their run differential is like hundred and fifty six. And What's funny about that is the AL East, if you look at it, every team but the last place team, I can't think of who it is right now, is over 500. Like almost every team in that division is over 500, and yet they're all like nine games back. If you're if you're trying to get into <laughs> baseball, follow the Tampa Bay Rays, read the articles about what they're doing in their clubhouse. I was listening to an announcer the other day talk about the Rays, and they said, well, what 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 is it about the Rays that makes them so good? And is it, are they are they really complicated? Or are they getting into the details? And the announcer said the player said no, they're just simplifying the game. Didn't get any more details than that. But their pitching is notoriously good, and then their hitting is is on fire this year. Randy Rosarina is one of the most exciting players in the game, and he was blowing the world up in the World Baseball Classic for Mexico. It was crazy. So yeah, they and Yandy Diaz is hitting the ball well, not necessarily playing great defense, but the OPS is is I think oh still over one thousand. I mean they're just crushing the ball. Yeah, they are, and they're doing it in a fun way too. Like they're having fun while they're playing. But they're not the only small market team that's overachieving right now. But I want to go back to what you said about the sample size, and you talked about the shortened season. Now the COVID shortened season was the best glimpse of that because if you look at the teams, number one, they extended the playoff field so that more teams could make the playoffs because there was such a difference in the way that that season went down. But because it was a shortened season, there were teams that made a playoff push or made the playoffs. The Marlins are the perfect example of that. They've been a laughing stock for how many years, even though they have a couple of world championships, and they made the playoffs. I know a lot of people said they wouldn't if it was a 162-game season. But my counter argument to that is, well, why do we need that many games? And if we can have some parity in the sport where these small market teams can have a little bit of a better chance to compete, isn't that better for the game? Well... I agree. So remember um, back, and I forget what year it was, they expanded it from 150 to 162. It used to be 150, and that was the whole story between the Babe Ruth single season home yes. run record and Roger Maris. Roger Maris yeah. However, uh, you know, the, for the owner's standpoint, they're making more money, more games, more money, more content. From the from the viewer, yeah, you that, that's what makes the NFL very special is every game ha carries so much weight. Baseball, you can, you're not going to win them all. You know that. You're going into it knowing that. And yeah, personally, me, you're asking my opinion. I I I wouldn't mind going down to 150. That's all. That that's what I want to hear, man. I want your opinion. However, 
the MLB did expand the playoffs that you touched on. Mm-hmm. And now, I mean, you're getting, that's how the Phillies got into the playoffs last year. That's how you're going to see other teams that are, that, that are able to like going down to the trade deadline. You're going to, you're going to see teams well, we're on the fringe and then they're going to make and spend that money and get that player. Yeah. That's exciting. But isn't that what you want? Oh yeah. The trade deadline should yeah. be exciting. I remember it used to be exciting when the Expos traded for Cliff Floyd because they were in first place. It was a big deal. Now wow. they didn't make it, Yeah, but that's okay. That happens, right? Like those things are going to happen, but this is, a, that's a dusty reference now because they, they were, that was like 20 something years ago, but that was a big trade for them because they historically had not been in on those trades. I mean, they traded away Pedro Martinez, remember? So, and they had Randy Johnson. I mean, <laughs> Apparently the Expos were just stacked. And they had Tom Brady, too, by the way. Roy Halliday? They, they no, drafted no, 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 Tom Brady. A, I mean, come on. Oh, they drafted Tom Brady. That's, that's right. right. Yes, that's <laughs> so, right. Yes. So let's just put that into perspective for the for the listeners. They had the two well, two of the greatest pitchers I ever saw play and the greatest quarterback I've ever seen play all on their roster. And they're no longer a franchise anymore. So I don't know what that says about them. But there have been other, sm- uh, other small markets. You didn't mention uh, Vlad Guerrero. Oh, I mean, of course, Vlad Guerrero. But <laughs> I, that was just adding, adding insult to injury at that point because they're just piling on. Didn't they have Gary Carter, too? Isn't he uh, another guy who was an Expos catcher there, Hall of Famer? I, you're, I know. You're going back on I that. I am I, going back. I mean, that's <laughs> what you got to do with the Expos. They haven't been around for like 15 years, 16 years. But you mentioned the Pirates. The Pirates, I feel like, are that franchise in MLB that has had such little success. But they're fun now. And McCutcheon is on the team again, yes. which you'd think it was like 2006 if yes. you were not paying attention. But unfortunately, they're coming a little bit back down to earth. And that we think we, we knew that was going to happen. But it's fun. Oh, yeah. And it's fun for that fan base who hasn't seen any semblance of success since, what, 1991? Well, I mean, their owner is, frankly, a piece of garbage. They, <laughs> he doesn't spend money. I think he's gone on record with how he's not going to spend any money on this team. Uh, it, it's just sad. If I was a Pirates fan, I would have been gone, done a long time ago. But something is happening that's magical in Pittsburgh this year, and and it's been a lot of fun. You've got a young team. Uh, they signed Brian Reynolds. That was that was a noticeable. They've got uh, their pitching is working. I I can't remember a time when their pitching has ever worked. Mitch Keller uh, has thrown two shutout games in a row. Uh, Bednar is on the team. He was on the the American uh, World Baseball Classic team, and he's he's been pretty dominant. I want to see him continue. They've lost. I think their last ten games, whatever they're like one and nine or something. Yeah, it's not. Good. It's it's they're on a skid right now. Can't. I, they might be in first place still. I, I haven't looked at the standings. Brewers but. are in first place as of today, which is boring. But that's just my my opinion. I find the NL Central to be pretty boring. There it is. There it is. Well, I'm just saying. There's just a lot of teams out there that have historically not been. I mean, there's the the, the Cardinals, Cardinals, of course, right? Yeah. The Cubs ebb and flow. They're obviously in a weird place. The Cubbies have been um, overachieving. I mean, this is their ideal situation to be middle of the pack right now, and and it's great. I'm I'm very I like the Cubs. I'm happy for them. You're right though. The Reds uh, below average. The Pirates are the surprise team, and they'll probably they'll probably come back to ground. Um, but. It's more about franchises that don't have a feel to me. And I've, it's not just baseball. I said this about hockey. The Carolina Hurricanes just don't have a feel to me. They're a boring franchise. I just don't have any emotion toward them whatsoever. And I think the Milwaukee Brewers are like that for me. I think the Ryan Braun situation started that for me. And then Yelich has been there. But I feel like Yelich has... As far as boring, you mean? The Ryan Braun being... Yeah, well, Ryan Braun, not even boring, but like the, the everything about them. Like they were a feel-good team when he was there and you had CC Sabathia, right? They were kind of making a push there. And it's kind of exciting because it was a team you don't normally see. And then the Ryan Braun stuff happened and I just, they haven't really been a fun team to watch for me. They've never really done anything outside of having regular season success and then they get to the playoffs and you don't see, Yeah, it'd be nice to see them make a run and I want to see them go back to the old pinstripes. Like if I'm being perfectly honest, I want to see that old school glove logo oh, yeah. in the World Series. Oh yeah. And I know it, what you're talking about. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? That like, lighter, that um, that more like bright blue yes. color. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Marlins brought back the teal, which I I'm love very the uni- happy about. I love the old unis. I hope they get in a lot of flair with the uni. I like the Marlins uni. I like the San Diego Padres, like old school. Um, I like 
It's like the brown one, right? The brown. Yeah, but it's like a it's got like yellow. It's like a little rainbow thing going on, like the old Houston Astros jersey, and it kind of works. But yeah, I would like to see that. But yeah, the Brewers are kind of a weird team. I, I see what you mean by them being boring. Um, Christian Yelich was like their big signing from the Marlins. He's got like lower back issues for years and years. Yeah. He's never really come That's and done I anything. Was hesitant to say he's underachieved since bringing them on because he was really good with the Marlins. Like so he was good. their cornerstone piece. Yeah. And he was unhappy there, very unhappy. And, you know, I don't blame the guy. No, I don't blame him at all for that. That's what the Marlins do. They sell their players. They get new players. They keep bringing them in. And and sometimes it works. Um, but, yeah, and then, and then the Brewers last year and the year before, they had the best pitching staff almost in the NL with – with uh, Corbin Burns and 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 Woodruff and uh, Peralta, they had a good one, two, three. And you're like, if they can go to the postseason, they've got those three. You need those kind of three guys to go into the postseason with, and they had that. So um, they're going to be in the mix, but yeah, there there's no bats that are jumping off the page at you no. on that team, and no. they they need the pitching to kind of carry them. Which it's because I'm a casual fan. Like if I lived out there, probably I would feel a little bit differently. Or if I was a fan of one of these teams, I mean, you just blatantly said you hate. The the Cardinals on on this, and I just said I hate the whole division. So I mean that, what, <laughs> and I lived in St. Louis. I have never been to St. Louis. I actually do not have much of an aversion to many of the teams. When I say I find them boring, it doesn't mean that I dislike them. It's just I'm apathetic about how I feel about. I them. actually you know love Nolan Arenado. Yeah, there's a couple players on that team that I like. Gold, Gold Goldie, Schmidt, Goldie, Goldie. Um, yep. killing it, and I and I love that because he was kind of dormant for a while, and he's he's having a late resurgence, which I love. Um, but yeah, that team is just. <laughs> It is, this is the worst I've seen the Cardinals and the best that I've seen the Pirates. And it's really weird. It is weird. You know what else is weird is all these small market teams are basically outplaying the big market teams. But the teams that spent a lot of money in the offseason, one of them is your direct rival in the New York Mets. And the Padres, they're kind of middling in mediocrity right now. And maybe it's unfair to think that they would come out guns blazing after making these signings. But when you're the Padres and what did they spend? $800 million? Some crazy number on these guys. And they still haven't even signed Soto, have they? So you're you're talking about their stuff. I think they control Soto for the remainder of the year. But why are they underachieving? Is it the fact that it just takes a while for a team to gel? Or have these, these teams overspent because they have owners who are new and want to make a splash, but they're not signing the right guys? Because baseball, a lot of times, the teams that end up winning the World Series sometimes come out of nowhere. I think of the 13 Red Sox in that regard. Like that was a team of a hodgepodge of a bunch of guys that on paper you're like, really? And then they they were the right fit at the right time. And they all happen to have like career years. But why is, I mean, Scherzer, a lot of people are saying he's done. Oh, yeah. And, and Scherzer is one of my all time favorite players. And that that hurts. But I knew it was inevitable. I mean, when they signed Scherzer, what are you going to get? Like two years out of him? Maybe yeah. Three. And, and that's if you're lucky. So and he's already I mean, yeah, he it looked like he needed the sticky stuff this year and he got in trouble for it. And he came back and didn't look great again. And now I think he's still on the IL. Uh, it's it's not looking good for him. Hopefully he can turn it around. Um, I'm rooting for him. But the um, yeah, you're right. Like these big market teams are underachieving. They spent the money. They want to see more. You, you will see them in the mix. But you're right. Like there is that X factor. This is why the game of baseball needs to be followed a little bit closer because there is that chemistry and that magic that happens in the dugout. The odds are not in your favor. The statistics are not in your favor. You should, this team on paper looks awful and they're getting it done. And that's that's exciting. Um, I, I, I feel bad for Mets and Padres fans. I know the Mets fans are a very passionate fan base, and I, I, I have to respect that. They've been they've been wanting to win for a long time. We'll we'll see if they can. Their <laughs> owner wants to spend money, too. Like They want, and that's a good sign. It is a good sign, to the point that all the other owners hate the guy because he's setting the bar so damn high. Oh, yeah. They're like, I don't want to do this. I mean, some of these owners, let's be fair, if we're being fair in our assessment of Major League Baseball owners, there's probably a handful of them, maybe even more, closer to half, who are like the Pirates owner who just want to make money. And they're going to pad that bottom line however they can. But I have a theory about the big market teams versus the small market teams. And it was while you were speaking, I thought, wow, he's, he's on to something here. And is it possible that these small market teams, and I'm talking about the Rays, they know that they're always going to have less to work with. So what they end up focusing on is less of the stuff that wows on the stat sheet and when free agency comes by. And they're looking for more of a fit. I mean, you have to have the talent to go with it as well. But then the narrative around these teams becomes, well, nobody thinks we're going to be any good. And then you get guys 
that end up being, they gel together, they work together. And I would actually contend that even the baddest teams in the league, like the Marlins being a 100-loss team last year, they may have had better team camaraderie than some of the other teams that were even in the playoffs and to some extent, because at least they're in it together. They know what their common mission is. Is, is there something to that as to why some of these small market teams maybe after years of being told that they're no good or like, you know what, screw this. We're going to make sure we get the guys that are going to fit in what we're looking to do. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, you're right that the sm- these small market teams are always going to have that problem. They're 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 never going to bring in the big dollar contracts that the Yankees and some of the larger like the Dodgers, the Phillies, you know, Boston can even command. So what they do is it goes back to like the old Moneyball mindset um, in the early 2000s. If you haven't read that book, you should read that book, and I'm sure you've seen the movie. It's on the bookshelf up here. There you go. So yeah, the um, the idea is that hey, how do I win with the small market teams? And the the information in that book, baseball's gone beyond that. It's it's evolved past where where that was, and that that's the interesting thing about the game is you can keep on. How do I get better? The Rays, they were looking at statistics that nobody saw before. Saber Metrics was kind of new about five years ago, maybe a little bit earlier. They were they were all in on Saber Metrics. They looked at, wow, we're noticing that the spin rate of the fastball is increasing the probability of having a strikeout. It's insane. And they'll they'll record that and measure that on their pitchers. They were doing that way before anybody that I know of. Uh, so the it, it, in Moneyball, I, I think I think that you'll see there's maybe an argument of what 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 would result in a win, a higher on base percentage or a higher slugging percentage, and that's still open for debate. But if you can get guys on base and not get out, not a bad thing. So yeah, I mean, you look at some. Well, let's let's look at some guys that can pad our power hitters. Like the Yankees are stacked with power hitters, <clears throat> and they can't. They they ended up losing in the playoffs, and they made a good run. And this year, they all look old and and injured, and no one's getting on base. Um, I hope for the best for them, but you know, then you get a team like uh, the Rays, and they're scrappy, and they're getting on base, and they're getting it done with guys uh, that are making uh, what like a fifth of the pay. So it's, you know, it's you you look at, hey, how are we going to win? How are we going to solve this puzzle and get and win? And and you got to love it. I mean, Lucas, it's so funny. My son, uh, seven years old, he was all in on the Yankees last year. If you remember this time last year and into the summer, the Yankees were the one number had the most wins in the league. We bought, and Aaron Judge was going in his historical run, which we got to watch, which is great. This year, he's all into the race. So, yes, he's a bandwagon fan. He's seven years old, mind you. However, you got to love what they're doing. We're watching the race every day, and, and they're a fun team. Here's a philosophical question for you. And you talked about the small market teams never being able to compete. In the NFL, their ad revenue sharing program is equal across the board. So the worst teams in the league and the smallest market teams in the league get the same cut of games in terms of ad revenue that they're supposed to, or TV revenue. In baseball, it is not the case. From what I have understood is that, as you pointed out very astutely, the Yankees have what, the S Network is like a $500 million contract, and the Marlins were lucky to get a $50 million contract. Why is it that baseball can never get to the point of an equal share? Because it seems like it would still benefit the owners because there's still a lot of money to be made. Because you could make the argument that if there's better revenue sharing, I know that there are revenue sharing things in Major League Baseball with the luxury tax and all that kind of thing. But it, to me, I've always felt like it was tricky accounting because there's a lot of ways in which you could make sure that that doesn't. It's like it's like it, when the casinos open in, in a state and they're like, oh, the money's going to go toward the general fund. And it's like, well, what is that? You mean in, in the essence of like better competitiveness yeah. and, and, and equal play? They say that it's for competitive balance. Balance, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like it to me. It feels like that's the way that they explain it away. But the players would also benefit from it too, wouldn't they? Because if the teams now have more resources, theoretically they could sign them to bigger contracts. And part of what they went on strike about last year was upping the average salary. Right. So guys like Max Scherzer are sitting at the table. Well, he just signed a $40 million deal. So he's good. But it's the guy that has been like the Drew Maggies of the world who are trying to just make a living and they're trying to up those salaries. So would revenue sharing the way the NFL does it actually benefit them? And are they just obtuse in not being able to make it happen? I've gone back and forth on this issue over the years so many times. Uh, for instance, you, you do have the luxury tax. So if a team decides they want to go spend, uh, they got to pay for it. And I, I don't know who's over the luxury tax now, but I would suspect it's the Yankees, the Mets, the Dodgers, maybe the Phillies. I Padres. think they did Padres. 
Yeah, the Phillies did last year. Um, so those guys are, are saying, yeah, we're willing to spend, we're willing to pay for it. Um, I Listen, like I, with what you're seeing on the field right now, I don't think it's necessary to have that competitive balance. It'd be nice to get, you know, like I, I think I mentioned earlier on the pod, I don't think we're going to see the Pirates in the postseason. The, this season's too long. And they did sign Brian Reynolds to what, a five-year contract extension. But so, yeah, you're right. It would be nice if they could get like one or two more guys, a bat and then an extra arm, and then they'd be able to go. Um, yeah, probably not going to happen. They What they rely on is trading away their talent and getting up rookies and then developing them and they are not very good at developing anybody so i know but like that's the that's the cycle that we get into the vicious cycle and it hurts me as a guy who loves why can't you be the race though why can't you just be the race that feels like an outlier <laughs> like okay oh yeah let's do that like hey man why don't you just be tom brady and just you know like win all the time like and not all the time but it, i feel like that is easier said than done and even but even the officials the guys that leave the front office of the Rays. When they go somewhere else, they don't capture that magic. Look at look at Bloom in, in Boston. He's getting so much flack because they didn't sign Bogarts. They didn't sign Mookie Betts, right? And there's something about the way that they work as a team that works. Like, and you, you can't even explain it. I'm not even sure they can explain it. They've got to be sitting there thinking like, I can't believe this is still working. Well, working. you never know what's going on behind those closed, door, closed doors. And, and Bogarts, I mean, he's killing it right now. I think he's one of the Padres that's actually yeah. doing well. Yeah. Um, and, and so that looks like a miss, but you know, you look, if you're a team and you're the front office of the Red Sox, you're like, okay, we, we think we realistically have a chance to sign a couple guys and Bogarts is going to be really expensive. We're not ready. You, you look at your team, the Red Sox, we're in a rebuilding year. And I think I, and before the season started, that's what I thought. And that's what probably what the front office thought too. Um, and they're, and they're doing well. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, they're in the mix of it. And if they're in the mix in it in July, you're thinking to yourself, maybe we need to, maybe we need to pull somebody in and get call, call up the Reds and see what they got. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, no, I think um, you're gonna get a team like Detroit, like that classically never makes it. They have a couple guys that could probably get traded. Erod, for one, could probably move. You know, we mentioned the Pirates, Bednar. I suspect he would move. I think you'll probably see a couple. Like, I, I think the Red Sox could be one of those teams that do that. I just wish we weren't in that cycle. I, I just wish that it was different, that we could see, because even you mentioned the Tigers. The Tigers, to me, are, it's sad, because they're like an original six team in hockey. Like, they were good. And Tiger Stadium, rest in peace, Tiger Stadium, like, used to be a quirky but yet great venue. And maybe this is just me getting old, and I'm I'm aging every second that this podcast goes by because we're talking nostalgia, but I don't know. I guess I wish the baseball, the the business mechanics of baseball would change so that we could see more than just what we see. And, and maybe that's asking too much. It's so difficult, though. You saw how difficult it is to negotiate with owners this season, even for even for basic salaries and and things that made sense. And you don't know exactly what was going on. You We heard like reports of things happening, but it, it was hard to it was hard to figure out exactly, you know, who to side with. You're like, well, the owners, they need to make money. The players, they want to have um, fair play and, and more, you know, more competitive pay for their younger and players that are coming up. Yeah, it, it's a, it is a tough call. I know that back in the day, you used to hear a lot about these players get paid way too much and they, they complain way too much when they go on strike. And as I've gotten older and understood more of life, you've probably been in the same boat. I look at both the owners and the players and think both of them are doing exactly what they should be doing. The owner should be trying to make as much money as possible because that's what they do. And the players should be trying to get everything they can out of the owners. And every time the CBA comes up, you're going to hit that impasse because both of these sides, it, I never blame either side because I'm thinking, well, who's supposed to budge? Like, are we really supposed to expect? I know the owners have the runway to be able to hold out because they have like generational wealth, but they're not just going to be like, yeah, you know what? Just go ahead. Just take it. Look at well, look at what MLB did in the playoffs. Okay, You're, we're talking about teams we'd like to see in the postseason. They expanded the playoffs. That was huge. It used to be it used to be four teams from each league. It used to be the division leaders and a one wild card. And now 
used to be less than that even back in the day. Used to go right to the championship series. So you could never see somebody that gets hot in August and September in the final quarter or third of the season that you're like, wow, this is an up and coming team and they're they're clicking and you can never see that happen. Now we're in year two of of an expanded playoff and I, I'm I can't wait to see what happens. I, I I think that you'll see smaller market teams have an opportunity to go for it. Yeah, you definitely will. I mean, and I like the way that they have adjusted the, they call it, they don't call it a plan anymore, but I didn't have an issue much with the one game sample. And I understood why people didn't like it because baseball is one of those weird games where like the Royals can take two or three from the Yankees and you can't explain it. You just say, man, baseball, and you kind of move on. So I get why one game isn't the best way to do it, but I love that there is suspense in that series. I mean, the Phillies last year, perfect example. We had a guy on the show, Coach's cousin, Alex, who came on. He's a big Cardinals fan. And this is back in during football season. We do what we call crunch time where we go through like 10 games. And he famously said, I think the Cardinals are going to show the Phillies what's up. <laughs> and at the Super Bowl this year, I put together a montage of all of our terrible picks. And that was one of them because he was so fervent of they're going to show him what's up. And they got swept. Like the Phillies just said, get out of here. And then they retired Albert Pujols. They retired Yadier Molina. They said, get out of here. <laughs> they tried to get Adam Wainwright out of there too. He's still holding on, I think. Yeah, in a three-game series. So yeah, that was... Exactly, that's what I mean. And the Phillies went to the World Series. And I know, personally, I thought they were going to win it. I was a believer that they were a team of destiny because it seemed that way. It did. And it didn't work out. Dusty Baker got his first World Series. So, you know... Happy for him. Yeah. Exactly, right. I mean, you as a fan, probably not as crushed as you would have been 20 years ago, but still not great. I still can't look at the Astros the same way. I still I still get like um, PTSD when I when I see that team play. They won fair and square. They, they play when I think. So you think. So you think. Yeah. Well, now the spotlight's on them. And Dusty got his World Series, which. Happy for Dusty. Happy for him. Yes, yeah. exactly. So as we get close to the end of this, the other big story in the news for for baseball has been the Oakland A's. And for many reasons, they've, they've managed to, if you had a checklist of how can we have the worst possible season imaginable from every angle, they have managed to do it. And I'm not even dogging. It's just a fact with the movement to Las Vegas that seems to be imminent. Everything that happened with their poor broadcaster over the weekend and being historically bad, like historically bad. They are 10 and 34. Yeah. And they had good players over the over the past 10 years that just nothing happened yeah. and they just squandered everything Matt Olson Matt Chapman a uh, couple a handful of pitchers that are that are still hanging around it, it just hasn't have Sean Murphy I think yeah. is on the Braves as well makes he was a good sad. catcher makes me sad that is a that's a franchise that has a lot more history than I think people today if you're new to baseball remember because they haven't been relevant in so long but they are, they're moving. And I, I wonder to myself if if that's kind of where we're headed in baseball. I have two things. Either, do you think that baseball is ever going to expand? Because I've heard a lot of that. Salt Lake City, Nashville's on the table, Charlotte's Charlotte. on the table for some of these places. Mm -hmm. But I personally wonder if that is going to further dilute the product and perhaps contraction is a better idea. It's, it's up for debate. I'm not saying I feel a certain way about it, but I want to bring that up to you with this news of the A's because they're going to move to Vegas. I think it's going to be good. I like it. I like I like the A's moving to Las Vegas. I think Vegas is a great sports town. It's going to be a good fit for them. It's they the ownership of the A's really better get their acts together because they they better they better get some money together because they need to make some signings or get some great draft picks or develop. Do they need to do something? They need to put their money where their mouth is. Like if they're going to relocate and talk about how Oakland's not giving us our stadium with public funds and all that stuff. So they're going to skip town and go to Vegas, which is fine because Vegas right now is like the new epicenter of sports where they got hockey team there. I say that they I predicted that they won't have an NBA team because I don't think Adam Silver has the appetite for it. But I feel like as I was saying those words, I knew they were crap because I'm like, they're going to have one like they they Vegas wants all of the teams. And they got the Raiders, so they're well on their way, but they have to win. They do. They have to go there and at least be competitive. You can't go there and suck. You can't go there and be terrible as a brand new team, as bad as they are, historically bad as they are right now. But uh, as for the uh, the other expansion cities, I like it. I think that there's enough talent out there that it would su it su support the competitiveness. Charlotte would be great, another East Coast team, because the only team that's in the Southeast is really Atlanta. 
Right. And that's what coach brought up to me about the fact that Atlanta holds such a geographic dominance they do. over the Southeast. And what I've heard is that teams like the Braves won't want a team in Charlotte because they have so much of that landscape now. But I honestly wonder if their fandom is not as heavy as it could be in those like outskirts of the South, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I agree with you and I disagree with Atlanta if they if they believe that. But yeah, it, I, I did go to an Atlanta Braves uh, game a few years ago, uh, maybe five years ago. Beautiful stadium. There was a there was a couple that I was talking to that traveled about two and a half hours to go to that game. That shocked me. I was like, wow. But that's still like, yes, two and a half hours is a long way to travel for a singular baseball game. Yeah. But two and a half hours in the South, you'd still theoretically be in the state of Georgia, potentially. I'm not sure. Right. So like it, it's a geograph, it's a it's an expansive geographic area that I can tell you from my my personal work is expanding like crazy. I mean, it, the numbers show them people are migrating down there. So I think that there will be an appetite for more. Nashville, I think, is another city that could have a lot of potential. They seem to have a fun fan base for the teams that they already have. Well, the Titans are boring, but the Predators, on the <laughs> other hand, I if, if you think if you thought my take on the NL Central was bad, you should hear what I have to say about the AFC South because oh, wow. uh, it's not good. But Nashville, I think, would be a great baseball town. Because much like hockey, baseball is much more localized in its fandom. Usually, baseball isn't as much of a national sport the way that it used to be. It's not like it's all regional, but I think you have more of a chance for these smaller cities like Nashville who are very passionate and they could come and have a great fan base. What I'm talking about is when I watched the Super Bowl and I and I had and and I saw the Eagles win in 2019 and I saw the Eagles kick butt this year. Should have won. And I went and watched the Super Bowl and there was this like this this the penalty call. I'm like, I'm losing my mind. And it just reminded me and and that sport's just a different a different animal. There's gonna be there's gonna be calls that are controversial that end the end the game. So I'm, and and I just looked at how I'm like, why do I invest myself into into a sport that is so controversial that I haven't? I knew it was gonna happen. Um, and, and, and it was just because I'm an Eagles fan and I was watching the game and I was like really into it and I got my heart torn in half. And I think a lot of people felt like that was an unfair situation, but, um, so I'm like, I just can't wait for baseball. It's, there's, there's more, there's more games. Yes, there are bad calls. Yes. There's a lot of things that are going on, but the, but the, the data, the data set is so big that by the end of the season, I think you can generally say <clears throat> you're getting the best teams into the postseason. You're getting the you're getting a pretty good postseason product now. I think it's I, I, I like it. I personally like it. And it's a faster game with more action. I mean, what can you hate? I think that it's working out. I did want to talk about Otani and the Angels, but I think we're going to save that for another time because that is a lasting topic that will be there until Otani signs a $600 million contract with whoever ponies up the dough. So we will leave that on the table. However, I want to start doing something every month with you and do a play of the month. And a play came across my bow that I want to describe to you because it's wonderful. Do you recall, gosh, this was what, 20 years ago, 23 years ago, spring training game where Sir Randy Johnson killed a bird with his fastball? Do you remember this? Yes, of course. I, yeah, I've seen the video many times. Famous video. Well, another Diamondbacks pitcher, hopefully I say his name right, Zach Galen, I believe, Gallen, also Killed the bird. This time, I believe, was with a curveball. So two Diamondbacks pitchers have done what is almost statistically impossible to do. Hit a flying bird with a pitch. And I think that's incredible. So Unbelievable. Honestly, yeah. And the fact that it was two Diamondback pictures just makes it even more improbable. And that's that's baseball, baby. Yeah, it is. Base <laughs> that is a great way to end this. John, I've had a really, really good time with you, but a little housekeeping. Don't forget to tune into Iceman and Coach every single week. Not only will we have some of these sub shows, but we have the main show, which we come out with every single week. Podcast, YouTube, wherever it is that you listen or watch, make sure to like, subscribe, rate, whatever is appropriate for wherever you watch it. As far as Coach is concerned, he is a host on the Pub Time Podcast. Make sure you support them wherever you find your podcast. Visit the Matty S Media Network website, mattysmedia.com to support the other podcasts that we have. Iceman and Coach, Fire Footwear, plus some others. I hope that this finds you well. I hope this finds you safe, John. It was a great, great time. I hope you had a good time. Gen genuinely, thank you for having me on. This has been a really great time. I agree. We will see you all next time. This is Flashing the Leather.
The opinions and viewpoints expressed on INC Sports are those of Matt Freights, Brad Powell, and their guests, and not necessarily those of the Matty Ice Media Network. INC Sports is exclusively owned by Matt Freights and Brad Powell and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.